He was conceived by a virgin through the power of the Holy Spirit, born into a world lying in wickedness. He was born to save his people from their sins. We do well to remember the incarnation of God the Son, not only on December 25th, but every day. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20 tells us, And we know that the Son of God has come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. We are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and the eternal life. This verse of Scripture reminds us of several essential realities concerning our fellowship with God. You'll notice that these realities are predicated on the world-changing fact that the Son of God is come. We have peace with God because Christ sacrificed on the cross. We have assurance of forgiveness and eternal life because of Christ's resurrection. Without the coming of Christ as man, as a man conceived and born of a virgin, peace with God, forgiveness, and eternal life would not be possible. The coming of Christ to dwell among Men is indeed, as the angel declares to the shepherds in Luke 2 and verse 10, good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. His coming was a sign of God's goodwill toward them, the hope of peace on earth. It's hard to believe we're coming to the end of 2020. We're not where I might have imagined at the beginning of the, of the year. Also, we were all surprised by the coronavirus pandemic and the reactions by the different levels of government. This did not surprise God at all. He's used this time to continue his work of drawing men and women to himself and conforming his people into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not know what the new year will hold, but we will move forward in the work of evangelism, discipleship, and church planting by the grace of God, for the glory of God, Brother Chris Bell. Amen. Just ask you to remember to pray for the Bell family. Anybody we need to add to the prayer list tonight? Uh, there's a lady, uh, Karen, my, my daughter-in-law, her first cousin, they were in a car down in Florida, and her name is Cattell, or Lombo, and Cattell was due to have 10 babies this week. I think today, anyway, they had a head-on collision. Her brother and his wife were in the car, and her husband. Her brother got killed, and she lost the swing. And she's been through about six surgeries already, and one to one, as we're here tonight. And they've already said they almost lost her. So I ask you to pray to tell her long hope. We pray for this one. We'll do that here in just a minute. Remember to keep praying for her. These two. Anybody else? Yeah. They're good Christian people, by the way. They're not out moral. They love the Lord. Anybody else? Remember to pray for the uh, Judy Barnes and the Barnes family. Our our long time Bill Ken wife was in the hospital and death with COVID. And other problems going on, and they're, they're talking about putting her on hospice. So I don't see they, they moved her out of Stateville yesterday, and her day for Wednesday, she's not feeling well. Anybody else? Pearl Jacks, we open us up in word of prayer. We open us up in prayer to pray for these that are sick. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that we have the opportunity to come to your house again. We thank you for this church that you put here to this place, Lord. Thank you for what it stands for, what it teaches. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that we receive for being here. All the blessings that you give us in our lives, Lord. And we pray that you might continue to walk over us in your house this far. And, and, and those, Lord, that, that are on our prayer list, and those that are lost loved ones, just pray, Lord, that. She might comfort them and watch over them and go near them in their hand. See their patience tonight, Lord, we put the word as we uh, read your word and, and, and glean from it, Lord, that we might be better Christians for you. And forgive us for many sins. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Second Chronicles <laughs> chapter number 23 is where we'll be today. Second Chronicles 23, we're continuing on with a look at the years that
Joash was the reigning king in Judah. Second Chronicles 23. I want to begin reading in verse number 16. Jehoiada, that's the priest, Jehoiada made a covenant between him and between all the people, between the king, that they should be the Lord's people. Then all the people went to the house of Baal, broke it down, broke his altars and his images in pieces, and slew Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And also Jehoiada appointed the officers of the house of the Lord by the hand of the priest, uh, the Levites, whom David had distributed in the house of the Lord to offer the to, to offer the burnt offerings of the Lord as it is written in the law of Moses with rejoicing and with singing as it was ordained by David. He set the porters at the gates of the house of the Lord that none which was unclean and uh, was unclean in anything should enter in. He took the captain of the hundreds, the nobles and the governors of the people and all the people of the land and brought down the king from the house of the Lord and they came through the high gate into the king's house and set the king upon the throne of the kingdom. And all the people of the land rejoiced and the city was quiet after that they had slain Athaliah with the sword. You remember Athaliah was Joash's grandmother who was overbearing and, wanted, and did rule over Judah and try to have all of her grandchildren killed so that they wouldn't ascend to the throne. And one of them made it, didn't they? Joash. And, uh, and the Lord knows how to work things out. With, with this passage that we've read tonight comes the idea of revival. If you have a Scofield Bible, and I'm not saying if you don't, you need to get one. I'm just saying if you do have one, you'll notice that he labels this portion of Scripture, the revival, through... Jehoiada, and then it goes on a little bit later, and we're going to see the revival uh, that comes about through Joash and, and, and all of that. Uh, but with the with the beginning of this passage comes in the idea of revival. I like verse number 21, the last verse that we read, and all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet. Wouldn't that be wonderful in our day and time? And uh, by the way, as uh, Brother Chris Bell said in his letter, the only hope that we have of peace and quietness and tranquility in this life is through Jesus Christ. But, uh, but, but the idea of revival is where we're kind of headed at in these next lessons, the weeks ahead, as we look at uh, the reign of Joash. Not just individual revival. And by the way, individual revival is a wonderful thing. And we pray for that. Lord, send a revival. Let it begin in me. And, uh, you know, if, if there's an effort of revival and you're the only one that's revived, that's okay. You know, that's, uh, that's uh, it's okay for the individual to be revived. And by the way, I, I've said this before and I, I believe it. Uh, revival is not something that... that we, we do pray for it, but it's not something that God is holding back from us. Revival is something God wants all of us to have. And, uh, and but, but if we were going to talk about individual revival, we might talk about Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. I mean, they were kind of the Lone Rangers in Babylon, you might say. They were just kind of there by themselves. Or we might talk about Elijah in the cave and, and uh, you know, how, the, how that... Uh, he, he said, even I alone remain a prophet of God. And of course, that wasn't, wasn't exactly true, but he thought it was. And, uh, and so we could, we could go to those places to talk about individual revival, but this particular passage put forth the idea of widespread revival. Um, we're talking about a whole church or a nation or a community. Uh, being revived or experiencing revival. And you'll notice right in the center of all of this uh, talk of revival is the house of the Lord. And I just want to say this as we start in on this subject. I, I believe uh, with all my heart that until believers 
get serious about church today, widespread revival is highly unlikely. And, uh, and we're talking about the house of God being in the center of the subject of revival. You'll notice the beginning of the revival is the defeat of Athalia here. Verse 21, the city rejoiced, all of the land rejoiced, the city was quiet after that they had slain Athalia with the sword. We, uh, we talked about a week or two ago how that she typifies or is a a type of the ultimate enemy that we have, which is Satan. And, uh, and, and I want to say this as well. True revival begins where the devil is defeated. And ultimately, the devil was defeated at the cross of Calvary. Uh, I mean, whenever Jesus came forth from the grave, the devil is as good as dead already. He's defeated. Uh, no revival on any scale takes place where there is no new birth, where there is no Holy Spirit. And so the beginning of revival is the defeat of the ultimate enemy, which is the devil. We see here in this revival effort, if we can call it that, uh, we see here that there was a covenant made, a promise, a commitment that was made um, at the very beginning. Verse number 16, And Jehoiada made a covenant between him and between all the people and between the king that they should be the Lord's people. I, I want to compare that with what it says. I, I think 2 Kings chapter 11 makes it just a little bit more clear uh, concerning this covenant. 2 Kings 11 and verse number 17, it says, And Jehoiada made a covenant Listen to this, between the Lord and the King and the people, that they should be the Lord's people. This promise, this commitment was made between the Lord and His people, uh, that they would be the Lord's people. And I, I want to say this tonight, we need to make up our minds that we're going to be the Lord's people. And, and I'm not just talking about salvation, but I'm talking about operating that we're going to operate by His law. For us in the New Testament, that means that we are going to operate within God's uh, ecclesiastical system, if you let me say it like that. I'm talking about uh, the church, the system where there's an ordained pastor, where the church is ordained deacons, where the church has its membership, where uh, the church collective is trusting the Lord to lead. We're going to operate... Uh, under the authority and power of the local church. Isn't that what we're supposed to do in the New Testament? We talk about kingdom work and things like that, and those are great things. Those are a great concept, so long as we understand our responsibility and accountability to the local church. And so, uh, so this covenant is made, and we need to make a, a covenant, a promise to God, that we're going to work His way, we're going to do His work His way. Commit to doing His work. The work of prayer, the work of Bible study, the work of witnessing, the work of praising, the work of testifying of His grace, the work of encouragement, and even the work of rebuke, if that's when, uh, and, and exhortation when it's needed. The onset of widespread revival out of this passage, I noticed three things tonight. First of all, the destruction of idolatry. Verse number 17, look at it again. Then all the people went to the house of Baal, break it down, break his altars and his images in pieces, and slew Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. There was a collective effort to stop the activity and spread of idolatry in that land. Uh, in Israel. Uh, it, and the question came to my mind, well, what if they had just stopped it in some places? What if they had just stopped it here and there? What if just some of the people had stopped worshiping Baal? Well, I think it's as simple as this. Revival would not have been as widespread as it was unless they all uh, made a commitment to the destruction of idolatry. 
The worship of Baal in Israel was damaging to the youth. You'll hear them talk about where they made their children to walk through the fire. That had to do with, uh, somehow or another, with the worship of this, uh, this false god. It was damaging to the youth. It was dividing, divisive, if you will, to the people of God. 1 Kings 19, uh, you'll remember that, uh, that Elijah the prophet stood on Mount Carmel. He called all of the people of Israel together, all of the prophets of Baal together, and he said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If God be God, worship him. If Baal be God, then worship him. It's divisive to the people of God. It's, uh, it, it, it distanced Israel from the Lord. Idolatry distanced them from God. I wonder, I wonder sometimes if America, what it has become today, is even recognizable in heaven. I'm talking about what it used to be. Does God see America? I mean, we can think back in our in our human minds and, and, and think about what it used to be, but does God even recognize it for what it used to be and what it began and how it began? Modern idolatry today. Uh, we could make a, an unending list, couldn't we? But what about just a couple of things? Money and materialism. Cash is king in our society, isn't it? People claiming to be followers of Christ and jeopardize their family and their calling of God while chasing the almighty God. Pride and self is a God in our day. We live in a self-absorbed society. The devil is capitalizing on selfishness in our society. Uh, he's strategically using modern technology to foster selfishness <coughs> and pride in people. Uh, I think you will agree with me tonight that social media has created a boldness in people to godlessly promote self. And I'm not saying that that's the way it is with everybody. I'm just saying that, that we, all, we all recognize it when we see it. People say and do things or post things uh, that, uh, that, that takes away from the glory of God. I'm not saying we need to quit Facebook. Facebook's not the problem any more than your television set is the problem or any more than your automobile is your problem or any more than your dollar is your problem or anything else. I'm saying we need to get over ourselves and start promoting God because we have, uh, we've made a, a God out of self and out of pride. The, the destruction of idolatry. Uh, the modern day worship of self is destroying our youth. Um, think about this. This whole business with abortion, the, their, little quick, their little catch phrases is, it's my body, my, my body, my decision, my body, my choice. Uh, I don't find that in the Bible anywhere. Uh, selfishness, you know, well, it's my career, and kids just don't fit into that program. Uh, it's my life, and uh, kids don't fit into that program. What about the verse of Scripture that says we're not our own, but we've been bought with a price? Um, but it's destroying the youth of today. The modern idolatry is dividing the people of God. It's distancing us from the Lord. We see... In this passage, widespread revival break out as the people of God unify together to put God first. Put God first. We're going to make God number one. Number two, we see the distribution of priestly duties. In verse number 18, Jehoiada appointed the offices of the house of the Lord by the hand of the priests of the Levites whom David had distributed in the house of the Lord. To offer burnt offerings uh, unto the Lord as it is written in the law of Moses with rejoicing, with singing, as was ordained by David. <coughs> we see a standard commonly accepted among the people as the rule of practice. They did it, it says in the middle of verse uh, number 18, according to the law of Moses. We could say the law of the Lord. We could say the word of God because Moses got... Uh, what uh, what he put in instituted put into action 
Uh, as far as uh, temple worship, he got all that straight from God. God's the one that told him what to do and, uh, in the book of Exodus. So whatever they did in the Lord's house would be held up to the standard and principles of God's word. They did it according to the law of Moses. And we see here an Old Testament ordinance with a New Testament application. In the Old Testament, uh, the Levites and the priests were ordained to tend to the things of the Lord, the things of the Lord in the house of God. There was the, the daily ceremonial services, talking about the sacrifices. There were the there were the the on the on the the day of atonement, which was one time a year, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, there was all of these services that had to be dealt with, but also there was daily housekeeping. There was, uh, and, and then on top of that, there was the praising and the singing. It talks about down there at the end of verse number 18. In the New Testament, the priesthood is a little bit different. You say, well, I, that, that leaves me out. No, it doesn't. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6 tells us that, that the Lord Jesus Christ has made us to be kings and priests. Under God. So uh, we get into the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. Do you believe tonight that everybody that's saved is a priest under God? We, we, we don't have to go through the Catholic priest to get to God. We don't have to confess our sin to anybody but God. All we have to do is go straight to God as a, as a believer, as a born again believer. We have that right, but with that right, each and every believer has the duty to perform the priestly duties of, of, uh, of being a, a child of God. Uh, we all need to be dutifully involved in the work of God. Not everyone needs to be doing the same thing at the same time. But I'll say it like this. You ought to be open for anything that you can do. Anything that the Lord will let you do or or uh, enable you to do, you need to be open to that. Uh, it's encouraging to see people uh, pick up on something that, uh, that maybe, we might say, maybe not normally in their zone, if I can say it like that. Uh, I, I think about things that go on around here, just, just like with the music. I mean, when you grew up, if you grew up in the time I grew up, uh, Billy Keith and Norman L. House were the face of music at Highland. We liked it that way. Uh, we didn't have any problem with it that way. Uh, but, uh, but isn't it good that, that, uh, that we have people like Henry or whoever that can pick up the slack when, uh, when, uh, when it's not normal, when times are not normal? The music, the speaking. Who in the world asked Betty House to speak at the Christmas program? Who would have done that? Well, that's a little bit out of her comfort zone. I think she would agree. But wasn't it a blessing? Uh, and so people, it's a blessing. It's encouraging to see people that uh, pick up on things that are not in their normal zone, if I can say it like that. We need to get involved. Find, a, find you a project person in the church. Uh, they're all over the place. We're all a project, aren't we? Uh, partner up with someone. There's your project right there. Uh, get, a, get a prayer partner. Uh, get into the worship service. Get into the preaching and the singing. Resolve to be a Barnabas in the church. The son of consolation. Wouldn't that be good if you were known as the son of consolation in the church? The encourager in the church. When only a few are involved in the work, the revival is not as widespread. The distribution of duty. Number three, the defense against enemy attack. Verse number 19, And he set the porters at the gates of the house of the Lord, that none, that none which was unclean in anything should enter in. Set some watchmen, some guards at the gate. We see a common conviction in these quarters, common conviction that what's on the outside could be damaging to what's on the inside. And until it becomes widespread conviction among the people of God that worldliness out there is dangerous to the people of God in here, I think it's unlikely we're going to see widespread revival. Uh, 
uh, what about uh, what are you talking about? Well, what about things like fornication? Fornication in the world that makes its way into the church is damaging. By the way, it's trying to get in here any way it can. Uh, heresy out there. I'm talking about things that uh, that, are, that are taught that are, are against what the Bible teaches about how a person is to be saved and what Jesus is and who he is and, and all of that. The, the things that, uh, that we don't believe they are out there in the world, it wants to get in. And it's damaging to the inside. Things like uh, rejection of the Baptist faith, it's all over in the world. But it's damaging to the people of God. Alien baptism. Boy, that's a, that's a weird word. We don't even know what that means. I'm talking about anybody that wasn't Baptist, that wasn't baptized in a Baptist, true Baptist church. That's, a, that's what alien baptism is. I, I found this. Some church put this out in publication. I thought it'd go good right here. I like the way they explain it. To recognize alien baptism is to accept as a member of a Baptist church any person on the basis of the baptism which he received in a church of another denomination. Today, a generation of Baptists has arisen, some of which have few qualms about recognizing alien baptism, and many of which have evidently never heard the term alien baptism. I think that's probably right. Uh, I, I, I think they, they probably got that right there. The Baptist rejection of the Baptist faith. And I know I hammer that a lot. But folks, we live in a world where, uh, where the Baptist faith, what we call the Baptist faith, is something that, that people just don't recognize as being special anymore. I'm talking about the faith that came all the way from when Jesus started his church on this earth. That's been perpetuated. And if you don't believe that that's the way it is, don't leave here and join the Methodist church because you can read their publications and they'll tell you that the Baptists were here before the Catholics. They go all the way back. That's the Baptist faith I'm talking about. It's widely rejected. And I can tell you, the devil wants it in here. The devil wants it on here, but it's so damaging. So we see a common conviction. These, the, the people had no, had no problem understanding that what was out there could be dangerous. We've got to keep it out. Any unclean thing, we've got to keep it out. We see a determination to keep it out. It says that uh, in verse, uh, verse 19, that none which was unclean in anything should enter in. None. None of them. We're going to keep it out. Said, well, but, but Porter, just, just this once. I, I know this guy's a leper, but uh, he's brother so-and-so's grandson. Why can't we just slip him on in? Why can't we just let that in? And, and questions come up sometimes. Preacher, why, why can't we let someone join our church even if their profession of faith is not biblical or even if their baptism is not scriptural? The answer is simple because we have a responsibility to God. Amen. Why can't we allow alcohol to be served at weddings? Why can't we conduct same-sex marriages here at this church? By the way, I, never, I try never to to hold a, my position or my job over anybody's head. I sure don't want the church holding it over my head, but I can tell you, the day that the church wants me to put on a rainbow mantle and perform a same-sex marriage, you better start looking for another pastor because I'm not going to do it. Amen. Why can't we? Why can't we use the corrupt version of the Bible for teaching? Why can't we do that? Because we have a responsibility to stand guard over the things of God. Amen. The idea of widespread revival requires widespread commitment to our convictions in the faith. You see, this covenant was not just between God and Jehoiada, or God and Jehoiada and the king, but this commitment was between God and all the people, it said widespread. That's where I want to stop tonight. Let's stand. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be in your house tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the
exhortation in it to, to contend for the faith. <coughs> Lord, we just pray that you would uh, you would have your hand upon our church and upon our people, protect our homes from disease, and from dangers, and uh, we just ask that you would be with those that are that are in the hospitals, that are sick right now, that you would bless them, touch their bodies, and heal them if it be your will. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.